Theologians have been divided over the years by a concept we call dispensationalism. The more liberal theologian does not believe in dispensations. The literalist does. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul writes, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He talks about a dispensation of grace. If there is a dispensation of grace, then before grace there had to be a dispensation of something else. We want to talk about the seven dispensations of history on today's Prophecy in the News. Gary's chairman is here to take this fresh look at the seven dispensations. And we've been stimulated to take a look at the dispensations uh, by this little book, What on Earth is a Dispensation by Ken Gilming. Uh, it's a good question, and it needs uh, every now and then to be asked afresh. Uh, Ken Gilming writes <coughs> uh, about the differences between what's called covenant theology and dispensational theology. And uh, about regarding covenant theology, he writes, Covenant promises made to Israel in ancient times are spiritualized into blessings of grace for New Testament believers, uh, with prophecy to be interpreted allegorically or figuratively. Uh, covenant theology takes uh, Old Testament promise <coughs> and sort of, uh, I guess, rewrites it for the church, saying, in effect, that Israel is a, uh, really a past event. Uh, the Israelites had their place in history, but they're gone. Whereas the dispensations look at prophecy literally and look at a regathered Israel that has to face certain battles before it rises again in the latter days. And th that's basically what we're looking at. The way the dispensations paint an overall very large picture of God's historic promises across the ages. As literalist theologians, we are not trying to contrive seven dispensations. They lay out very plainly, very simply. And uh, Gary, on today's program, let's talk about, uh, first of all, the seven feasts of Israel mm. and how they depict these seven dispensations. Mm. Now, the dispensations, again, uh, and we should review, are <clears throat> really built around history, beginning with Adam and Eve. And you have the dispensation of innocence in the garden, followed by the dispensation of human government, the Canaanite civilization, followed by the dispensation of promise. Here came Abraham, and to him was given promise, followed by law given to Moses, and that was followed by uh, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ instituting the age of grace. We're now in that particular age or dispensation. And finally will come the kingdom. Seven historic dispensations. We're talking about literal history here, past, present, and future when we're talking about the kingdom, uh, which will be initiated by the great yes. tribulation period. And as we noted on our last program, it also has a menorah design. Yes. But now these seven feasts of Israel, with their menorah design as well, actually depict these seven dispensations. In the springtime, the Jewish people observe Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. After the spring harvest, along about June, they celebrate Pentecost. In the autumn season, there are three more festivals that have been given in the Mosaic Law. The Festival of Trumpets, which is on the first day of the seventh month, followed by Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, ten days later and five days after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, these seven feasts actually depict the great dispensations of human history. They lay out perfectly. Let's begin, Gary, with the Passover and the dispensation of innocence. Now, when Adam was, was created, he was created in a perfect environment, absolutely innocent. And his counterpart uh, in, in this uh, figurative history of the ages would be uh, the first age that is, or the first feast of Israel, Passover, and the centerpiece of that, uh, that festival is the lamb. Uh -huh. And it has to be a lamb of the house, J.R. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in Exodus where, and I don't have it in front of me here, but I can go ahead and just talk about it. Ah, here it is, in Exodus 12, 3. Uh, the specific phrase is used concerning the Passover lamb that it must be a lamb for the house or a 
I guess the expression, really it's more like house lamb. A little lamb that's been raised in the household. It's, a, it's kind of a bosom little buddy. There's nothing more cut, cuddly and cute than a little lamb. And this is a house lamb that must be slain. And this little lamb is so innocent. In the it children's pet? The children's pet. It was innocent. Right. It was perfect. perfect. No blemish That's whatsoever. Right. They had to inspect it for three days, didn't they? That's right. And so the dispensation of innocence, the lamb, became the substitute for man. Now, what, uh, what this means, and bear this in mind as we go through the seven dispensations, the seven feasts of Israel, is that we're not forcing uh -huh. a description of the dispensations at all. These all fall or overlay each other in a very natural way. And seven, of course, is God's number of completion. Now, along with this uh, Jewish festival of the Passover, they are observing at the same time the festival of unleavened bread, which goes on for a week. Mm -hmm. And this depicts the dispensation of conscience. Yeah. Now, what happened after Adam's fall? Basically, uh, the, uh, God kind of stepped back and, and said, all right, Adam, <clears throat> I'll let you and your people do what they will. We're going to let life unfold. And life did unfold as the Canaanite civilization developed, as, the, uh, as the, uh, the line of Shem, which was the Messianic line, also developed. And J.R., they were allowed to develop according to the dictates of their own conscience. Mm -hmm. And this corresponds to unleavened bread, uh, I believe, because the bread is a broken figure. That is, it, yeah. it, it depicts sin, the breaking of the body of man. The, the, the main word is guilty. 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 Jesus became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so it comes then to the resurrection. We have both the, the death and then the burial. Now the resurrection mm -hmm. of Christ on the first day of the week of uh, following Passover is the festival of first fruits. It represents human government. Tell us how. Human government. Now, uh, the interesting thing about first fruits is that first fruits uh, is represented in the figure of Noah who came through the flood and basically is the resurrected humanity. Noah and seven other people came through when, they, when that ark rested on dry land, the first thing he did was plant a fruit of the vine, start a new civilization. It's a resurrection. Yeah, in fact, Noah himself was the first fruit of a new civilization, wasn't he? That's correct. And so we have the fruit of the vine pictured by the first fruits uh, and human government. Now we come to Pentecost and the dispensation oh, of promise. Yeah. This one is beautiful. Pentecost and the dispensation of promise. Pentecost is the movement of God's Holy Spirit bringing about a new thing. And this is exactly what happened uh, when Abraham was called into the new land, called into the Holy Land, the land of promise. And God covenanted with him and actually set his sign and seal on that covenant with a, a, a fiery lamp while, while Abraham lay asleep. And that lamp, the flames of that lamp correspond uh, to both to the servant lamp, the center lamp of the menorah of seven, mm -hmm. and also to the tongues of fire in the New Testament at Pentecost with yes. the giving of the Holy Spirit. The idea here is promise and Pentecost. Pentecost is a harvest festival. It's set right in the middle. Three feasts, uh, the festivals before it, three after it. It sits right in the middle. It depicts promise, the promise, the earnest of our inheritance, salvation, the Holy Spirit. Now that's a very important statement you made there. Is the Holy Spirit is the earnest or the promise of our inheritance. That's a dispensation of promise with Pentecost. Pentecost. Now we come to the festival of trumpets and it corresponds to law. Mm, law. Moses, the lawgiver. And the interesting thing is that on the third day where the children of Israel gathered around Mount Sinai, the trumpet sounded over the mountain. There was fire. There was smoke. It was a time of great horror, fear, giving of the law. It was a time of awe, and everybody was declared guilty under the law, J.R. Mm, incredible. The dispensation of law with the festival of trumpets. Trumpets. And uh, then comes Yom Kippur, ten days later, uh -huh. and it depicts the dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Of course, our great atonement is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made atonement for us and given rise to the age of grace. It couldn't be simpler. 
And then, of course, comes the Feast of Tabernacles and the dispensation of the kingdom. Mm. Tabernacles. This is the time when people uh, uh, eat of the fruit of the vine. They celebrate the fall harvest in the land of peace and prosperity under Messiah. It's a time uh, when the fruit is finally born out of a world of conflict. Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles is a picture of the dispensation of the kingdom. Yeah. God has not contrived these seven dispensations of human history. They lay out quite naturally throughout the scripture. Gary Sturman is here to discuss these, this fresh look at the seven dispensations. Mm -hmm. And we have a message from Paul in Colossians 1.25 and following in which he explains that the dispensations have not always been understood, but now the mystery has been revealed. He writes, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's talking here about the age of grace, which is typified by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And he says, in ages past, this system of laying out periods of time uh, across history was just unknown. But now, he says, it has been revealed. And Paul reveals it to us, his saints, makes the, uh, the mystery very clear. In fact, J.R., when we look at sevens, whether it's the menorah design or whether it's God's uh, seven days of creations given in Genesis or 7,000 years of human history or 70 years of a man's life, the pattern holds uh, right across. Yes. You know, man is not born into the dispensation of grace. You have to realize you're a sinner before you can receive Christ and receive eternal life. Eternal life only comes after conviction and you repent of your sin. Well, there has to be law to show you that you are a sinner. And so the dispensation of grace has to come at a particular point in a person's life. Let's take, for example, a picture of uh, the life of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, 70 years, 7,000 years. 7, years. 7, um, that means that each year of a person's life actually depicts the development of the human race throughout history mm -hmm. in each century of history. Well, J.R., we know that the first one holds for sure. Innocence. What could be more innocence than a little baby just home from the hospital? Yeah. And everybody comes in and takes a look at this beautiful little child and says, oh, he looks just like his father, just as Adam was made in the image of God, mm -hmm. you see. And uh, then, of course, this little child's in his own Garden of Eden, perfect environment. What could be better than being completely taken care of by mom and dad? But uh, innocence fades, unfortunately. <laughs> As this yes. little child gets older, uh, he begins to exert self uh, in this long road ahead of him. And it's just like humanity. Yeah. Uh, a little after birth, uh, uh, there was the exertion of self because there were two natures there in that garden. That's the dispensation of conscience. The little child sees something on the coffee table that he wants and he reaches out his hand to get it and daddy says, no, no. Mm. That's when the little devil is determined to get it <laughs> in spite of all that you can do. And you can see conscience written all over his face, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, like jelly all over his face. Oh yes, <laughs> chocolate frosting. Yes. So the dispensation of conscience, sometimes we call that the terrible twos. Mm -hmm. The terrible twos. And, and basically now we are looking at, at not at just as at a little baby or the growth of a human being, but we're looking at humanity at large. Mm -hmm. And after conscience, when we look at the dispensations, we come to uh, the rule of the, of the Father. We come to human government. Yes, the despotic rule of father and mother. And the child has to begin to be trained. And the child, if uh, he responds, Jar would, would, would mature mm -hmm. yeah. into this rule. Yes. He would take well to it. But you know, uh, most of them go kicking and screaming. That's true. Now we've got Cain and Abel, good and evil, yeah. born in the heart of a child. And um, the Abel part, I think, can be seen in the innocence uh, of uh, the purity of uh, Adam's origin. 
Uh, you know, Adam named all the animals. Well, the child during those young years also has animals with names. There's Mickey the mouse, and Donald the duck, and Bugs the bunny, and so on. And so we have uh, uh, this growing up in the dispensation of human government mm -hmm. of mom and dad, and by the time he gets around seven years of age, dad looks and says, he's not a baby anymore. Mm -hmm. He's growing up. And mm -hmm. I think this is when Cain kills the Abel factor. Mm -hmm. We see that he is no longer a baby. He's becoming a man. Well, if you look across human history, there was the age of the flood, <clears throat> a crisis when when man had to be judged. Uh, do we find a flood in, in yeah. the life of a man? Yeah, and, uh, and that's really toward the end of the human government. When a child becomes a teenager, uh, the imagination of his heart is evil continually, just as Genesis chapter 6 says. Mm -hmm. God has to send a flood to wash away the evil that, that the good might remain. And to the teenager, every problem is overwhelming. It is a flood. Yeah. My ears are too big. My arms are too long. Nobody mm -hmm. loves me. Nobody likes me, and so on. Uh, so a child really goes through a tumultuous time in those early teens. And there's going to be a flood. Now, if that child will stay in the family unit, that is, in the boat, mm -hmm. and not jump out of the boat, he'll, he's going to make it through the flood. Mm. But some teenagers run away from home. They jump out of the family unit, and then they are drowned. I mean, it's, it's terrible the things that happen to teenagers today when they leave the family unit. Well, <clears throat> after the flood, humanity kind of uh, got a rebirth. It, it resumed. It, 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 mm -hmm. uh, a new civilization was developed. And Abraham came out of that flood. What corresponds yes. to that period in the life of the Well, you know, man? leading up to Abraham, remember Noah dabbled with uh, the fruit of the vine, oh, yes. and Ham created the sin and was marked by it. Well, a young person, when they um, dabble in the forbidden fruit, they too can lose their innocence. They can, they, can, uh, they can have the mark of Ham upon it. It can stain their lives. A drinker can become a drunkard yeah. during those times. Well, uh, go west, young man, go west, was what God said to Abraham. And a uh, young man around age 20 or so, you know, it was 2,000 years when God called Abraham, Around uh, age 20, a young man determines he's going to uh, have his promised land. Mm -hmm. And he, it's promised at that time. He says, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. But he's not a doctor and he's not a lawyer. He has to go to school and learn. Right. He does not yet possess. It's only promised. Mm -hmm. And then he enters into his 20s and yeah. on toward his 30s. And we have the establishment of, I guess, a new era. Yeah, the dispensation of law. Around 2,500 years after Adam, Noah, uh, a a Moses took the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, brought them to Sinai, made a covenant, marriage with God. Mm -hmm. And a young man around age 25, give or take a few years, depending on the culture in which he was raised, yes. sees a young girl, a, a young lady, he takes her as his wife, and they make a covenant, you know. And he promises that he's going to keep the law, the love, covenant of the marriage Love, covenant. honor, and obey. In fact, he will keep the covenant. She'll see to it that he keeps the covenant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, indeed. And then they have that child, that first baby boy, and, and that dispensation starts all, all over again with innocence, you see. Along around age 30, the man matures. Mm -hmm. Age 30 is the year of maturity in the Hebrew culture. And uh, that's a picture of 3,000 years when Solomon becomes the king. Wisdom. The, the age of maturity and wisdom. Ooh. And the father looks at that son and says, you know, he needs to get in Sunday school and learn how to act. And so they start taking him to church. And during the early 30s of a man's life, he goes through his captivities years. That is tumultuous. There's all kinds of problems. It could be marriage problems. It could be financial problems. If it's an Assyrian captivity, like divorce, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, it's disaster. But by age 40, mm -hmm. he's, he finally does what he needs to do because he wants to. And you know, 40 is, uh, corresponds to the 4,000th year of humanity. That's when Jesus came. Yeah. And the dispensation of grace starts at 40. It's either a midlife crisis or it is a um, life begins at 40. For the next 20 years, the greatest mm -hmm. years of a man's life. 40 to 70, I guess. To, to 60, actually. To 60, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then after 60, man begins to think about uh, kind of settling down. Retirement. 
At 60, he turns the family business over to the son. He settles down for the next 10 years to enjoy life. And at the age of 70, give, a, give or take a few years, he'll die and go on to his eternal abode, the new heavens and the new earth. And so we have the dispensation of the kingdom rest at retirement, the golden age. Yeah, what we have really is a natural pattern, the pattern of life. And that's why yeah. the dispensations are so easy to understand. If you'd like to learn more about the seven dispensations of human history, let me recommend this book, What on Earth is a Dispensation? A Fresh Look at the Seven Dispensations. It's available through our ministry, 1095 is the price, and we invite you to call our 800 number that you've seen on the screen and get the book. Gary, mm. fascinating, these seven dispensations. Indeed, and what's, I guess the bottom line, JR, is according to Paul in Ephesians 3, 2, we now live in what he calls the dispensation of the grace of God. And that means that grace is extended to you. It's, it's not a moment too late for you to accept that grace of God. If you realize you need Christ, and without Him you would die and spend eternity in hell, pray and ask Him to forgive you and save you. And you can accept your dispensation of grace today. This is J.R. Church and Gary Sturman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For a free complimentary copy of the magazine, call our offices directly at 1-405-634-1234 or write to Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73153.